We have our Georgia criminal indictment of Trump and 18 others. We have our four conspiracies, including under RICO. We have our 161 overt acts. We have our 13 new felony counts against Trump. Some cooperating witnesses with the federal indictment, like Mark Roman and Mark Meadows, have been indicted in Georgia. And others that were barely cooperating, like Rudy Giuliani, have been indicted in Georgia, too. We have our judge, Judge McAfee, who used to work under Fawny Willis in the DA's office. We have cameras in the courtroom. We have our jail, the Rice Street Jail, for booking and processing. We have our arrest warrants. We have our self-surrender date to avoid being a fugitive fugitive of justice deadline of August 25th. We have Fawny Willis telling people that she's ready to go in March. Look out, Manhattan DA, against all 19 defendants in one trial. You thought federal judge Chutkin and Jack Smith's latest indictment was all business and no politics in her courtroom? Wait until you get a load of Fulton County process every day in every way, treating Trump like the common criminal felony defendant that he is. Of course, Trump liked the fact that at least 12 overt acts in furtherance of the criminal conspiracy consisted of his own tweets so much that he's decided to give all prosecutors another gift of new evidence and hold a press conference and issue a report as to why Georgia election was corrupt. And he really won. And he's going to do that before he self-surrenders. Trump is just a B I always be interfering with the results of the election and the peaceful transfer of power. Next, now that Fawny has obtained her sprawling, sweeping, multi-state, 19 defendant criminal RICO indictment, what, if anything, does Jack Smith do next? And how do two prosecutors coexist when occupying the same piece of real estate, election interference and fraud in Georgia and six other battleground states that overlap with both prosecutions? It's like a scene out of Jurassic Park, election crimes unit. Does Jack move to supersede and amend his indictment? Indictment? Should and will his case go first for justice's sake? And if so, when? And what about the New York State case brought by the Manhattan DA? First out of the box, first to indict, but will it be the first to be tried in March? And what about Trump's efforts to disqualify the judge up in New York? Should that case be sidelined for now as Fawny Willis and or Jack Smith's cases go first? And finally, Twitter and its counsel are in hot water with a federal judge who not only fined them $350,000 for producing late everything about Donald Trump's Twitter account and slid into their his DMs and user information, but she lit into them for tipping off Trump and trying, in her words, to curry favor with Trump, who had just been replatformed back onto Twitter after Elon Musk's purchase. All this and a whole lot of analysis we haven't even thought of yet, nor probably prepared for, only on Legal AF Podcast on the Midas Dutch Network with your regular anchors, Karen Friedman, Ignifolo, and Michael Popak. Hi, Karen. Hello. Don't you love when that happens when in the middle of us talking about something, you come up with another oh, theory? Yes. You're but like, you oh. know what? I love the fact that you and I, well, first of all, we start from a, 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 a solid place, right? You're th almost 30 years as a prosecutor, 32 years as a defense lawyer um, in, in courtrooms like the ones that we talk about on this show. And then, yes, we, we, yes, we prepare, of course, for the things that we're going to talk about and things that may happen in real time while we're doing the show. But we're, we're drawing and pulling from our instincts, from our gut, from our expectations about how things work because we've seen it done in hundreds and hundreds of cases. And so let's kick it off because we have a lot of prosecutor oriented inside the minds of prosecutor stuff today. And I can't think of a better person to discuss all of that with than the former prosecutor, lead prosecutor, and number two in the Manhattan DA's office than Karen Freeman McNifolo. So let's kick it off with what's going on um, in Fulton County. We the Midas touched at a great live show. The brothers held down the fort while you and I, I think you weren't feeling well. And I had a, I was tied up doing something else and I couldn't jump on so much later. Um, but, and I think we, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the 98 pages and the mm -hmm. hundreds of counts. And I know you have a very good reasoned opinion about some of the, uh, the work that went into the indictment and the out and the output. 
But let me just give the highlights of some of the th critical things that are going to go that are going to happen going forward, um, under the assumption that everybody already sort of knows the basics, which is Donald Trump and eighteen others indicted under the Georgia really expansive uh, racketeering. Um, Influence and Corrupt Organization Act, a, a set of statutes that was originally uh, established to go after organized crime like the mob, like in the Godfather era, but has been used time and time again um, in other public corruption, public integrity, financial securities fraud cases, really, you name it, there's no limitation as the body of law has been developed through the Supreme Court and otherwise um, to it. And, and the person who is probably considered the, no pun intended, the godfather of RICO is always been um, Rudy Giuliani, who's now on the receiving end of being indicted by the very type of statute that he used so successfully for five or six years as the uh, U.S. Attorney for New York, for Southern District of New York. Um, and that's what launched him to national prominence and got him the mayoralty. Um, and now, you know, sweet justice, sweet irony, he's on the other side of it. Although he's, although he's complained about, that's not what it's supposed to be used for. Although he's, you know, look at that picture of Rudy there that's up on the screen. What happened to that guy? Where did that guy go? He's been body snatched and replaced by some somebody else that's no longer Rudy Giuliani, um, who flip-flops constantly. Um, we got a hot take that's running about Rudy at a press conference in 2016 saying that Hillary Clinton is a criminal. She ran a criminal, organ an organized crime family that under racketeering RICO sh should be indicted and we shouldn't send a criminal to the White House. Okay, let's just use those same terms, but insert Trump. And, and and the fact that Fonnie Willis used it, which we we've been telling our audience for the last eight months, nine months, that she's she's going to use the most ex, most powerful tool in her arsenal and a prosecutor's arsenal is conspiracy. And the best of conspiracy for this type of case is RICO conspiracy because you can attach and connect all of the defendants and all of the overt acts and all of the predicate acts and lump them all together and make everybody responsible for it. We have an arraignment. Um, that's now been set. It's going to be uh, an arraignment. Oh no, there's a proposed arraignment September the fifth, because in in Georgia they uncouple arraignment from processing, booking, uh, and processing. Those th two things are 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 uh, not together in one place like in the federal court system. So. Uh, Fonnie Willis and the judge presiding, Judge McAfee and the sheriff have given everybody, all 19 people, until the 25th of August to self-surrender. And very helpfully, the jailer of the um, Rice Street Jail, Fulton County Jail on Rice Street, and the sheriff has said, you can come on down anytime you like. We're open 24-7. I'm not making this up. Um, you can just come on in and street clothes and we'll process you, process you which means booking, fingerprinting. Uh, could be digital, could be the old fashioned black ink, ink pad, put your hand down on it and roll your thumb to your pinky. I'm not sure what they do in Fulton County. Um, I can tell you that the Fulton County jail is not a fun place, not the actual place for the processing with the mugshots and all that. But above it in the jail, three people have died already in this month in Fulton County. But there uh, we have on the screen, when you're an arrestee, uh, there's a whole processing, an intake thing and a checklist. And Donald Trump has to read the website like anybody else. He's not going to get any special advantage. So he'll go by the 25th. Maybe he'll do this press conference on the street corner, um, like some strange, you know, street corner barker and uh, three card money guy. And he's going to he's going to talk about why he thinks Georgia fraud happened. Then he'll go in and get his mug shot and fingerprints and then he'll come back out. And then we have a presiding judge. We have Judge McAfee, a Federalist Society member who is also picked to replace a, a departing judge by the governor who's Republican of Georgia, uh, Governor Kemp. He was the inspector general for Georgia. So he was the chief Boy Scout. He looks like a Boy Scout in the photo. He's 34 years old. He's the youngest and most inexperienced judge on Fulton County's bench. They got 19 judges. He's number 19 in seniority. He's been on the bench for three months. I'm not making this up. Everybody like around the world and the country are probably thinking, Paul Puck, you're making stuff up now. We gave Judge Cannon, the least experienced judge in the Southern District of New York, the Mar-a-Lago case. We gave this, this is the best they can come up with, but this is how random wheel selection happens. He is the presiding judge. He will be the judge here. Interesting fact. He also uh, worked under Fawny Willis before she became the DA when she was the head of the complex litigation department or division of the 
Fulton County DA, she had one Scott McAfee working under her. That's not a disqualifier. I'm just putting it out there. So you got a Federalist Society Republican Boy Scout who's been appointed, very, very inexperienced. But you know Donald Trump will find a way to attack him. And uh, and now you have finally the uh, proposed series of dates with Fawny Willis telling the world as of just now, I mean just now, that she's ready for trial on the 4th of March of this coming year. So we, we've we been very careful at looking at the calendar and trying to slot all of this checkerboard together. And we basically gave March over to New York because that's where the Stormy Daniels hush money cover up business record fraud case is being handled by Karen, your old office. But but Fonny's like, a oh, F it, I'm, I'm doing March. I like March. I have a big, big RICO case and I want to do March. So that's where we're at now. Come in as the prosecutor. Tell us about what you thought about the, the quality of the indictment, issues with the indictment, if there are any, and this March trial date. And where the Manhattan DA's office and their position, because they've already sort of taken a position in July about whether they'll yield to other bigger cases. Where do you think all this kind of slots together? The indictment is 98 pages long, charges 19 people, 30 unindicted co-conspirators, uh, 41 substantive criminal counts. But within that, there's a, over 160 acts that relate to either the RICO or the conspiracy, which I'll, I'll describe in one minute. Uh, there's 22 counts related to forgery or false documents or statements. There's eight counts related to soliciting or impersonating public officers, three counts related to influencing witnesses, three counts related to election fraud or defrauding the state, three counts related to computer tampering, one count of RICO, the racketeering count, and one count of perjury. Trump and Giuliani are both charged with 13 counts each. That's the most of anybody. John Eastman is next with nine. And then you've got uh, Ken Cheesebro and Sidney Powell each with seven. Mark Meadows, Jeff Clark, Jenna Ellis with two. And then there's some people I've never heard of that are, are also charged um, who are sort of lower level people. Now, what is RICO? What is conspiracy? Why charge it? These are all kind of these murky questions that I'm sure a lot of people are like, I've heard of it, but I don't really know what it is. What's the difference? And I will not pretend that I'm a RICO expert, but let me try and explain it the way I understand it. So conspiracy, when you charge conspiracy is two or more people agree to commit a crime together. And conspiracies are universally available all over the country, both in state and federal court. And you, in there you need an agreement and you need an agreement to commit a crime. And you have to have committed some number of overt acts. Some states only require one overt act and an overt act is just any act. It doesn't have to be criminal. So it could be two people agree to go rob a bank together. Uh, they agree they're going to rob the bank. They mean it. And one of them rents a car. Uh, and, he, and he's going to be the getaway driver. And then they get caught before it happens. They would be charged with conspiracy to rob a bank. And the the um, rental of the car is an overt act, right? It's not illegal in and of itself, but it's they took a step to to towards their agreement. And so you will see she's charged conspiracy here, but she charged RICO conspiracy, which is like a type of RICO, but it's still conspiracy within it. And you'll see in there some of these counts, some of these 160 acts that she charges, she says they are overt acts and furtherance of the conspiracy. And, and what she's doing there is she's spelling out that that's what that relates to. Because for RICO, and RICO is very different than conspiracy. It's sort of, I think one commentator, um, Norm Eisen, called it a conspiracy on steroids, which is kind of what it is. RICO is much more serious, it's much more severe, and it requires more. And it stands for the Racketeering Influence Corrupt Organizations Act. It was passed in the 70s in federally. It became a, a thing in the 70s. And it had to do with, I think, the mafia and other gangs. And because there weren't really statutes that encompass all of the activities that groups, that organized groups commit together. You have low level people, high level people, some people don't even know of each other, but they're all part of the same group and they all share a common goal. And so, for example, there aren't a lot of 
crimes that fit the conduct of a president trying to steal an election because no one would ever believe that that is something that would happen, right? However, there is this crime called RICO that talks about a group of people that has a structure and a common purpose. And the common purpose here would be to steal the election and you commit crimes in the process. And so again, you don't, not all the people have to even know each other. They don't have to have talked to each other. They don't even have to, uh, have have the same common purpose, meaning this group could be the one who's going to break into the computers and that one's going to be the ones to try to do the fake electors. And this one's going to be the one to pressure the secretary of state. They're all, they, they don't necessarily have the same job description in this common purpose, but they do have the same common purpose, which is to steal the election. So here you've got an enterprise or an organization. You've got uh, this group of people and the leader is Donald Trump. And you've got all these individuals under him, including un uncharged or unindicted co-conspirators, which means they may or may not be cooperating. All I know is they weren't charged here. And you have to have committed two crimes in furtherance of this uh, Rico, unlike overt acts in a conspiracy, again, remember we said that doesn't have to be a crime, your overt act. These are overt acts that are crimes. So predicate acts that are crimes. And so it would be, it would be, you know, my, I, I'm part of your group. I have the same common purpose, meaning I'm going to steal the election and I forge documents, right? That's one crime. So this requires two crimes. And so if you go through the 160, you'll see the crimes that are listed in there. She, she will say that they committed this crime in that act and that this is both an overt act in the conspiracy as well as a RICO act. And so that's, that's the distinction in there. Now, there's a there's a couple of places where I think there's some mistakes in the indictment. And my own theory is that this indictment was uh, it was intended to be was intended to be pu uh, published and voted on on Tuesday. But the clerk of the court accidentally posted the front of the indictment on Monday, they then uh, put it put a statement out saying, oh, that was just a, a dummy mock up that we did to try and um, to try and see if the computer system worked. But I think that's a little bit of a weird excuse, given the fact that I think it matches perfectly with the actual indictment. So anyway, um, but the but the point is, I think that might have might have pushed her to rush this. And that's why they stayed late on Monday. And they voted this because there are some sloppy errors. For example, you'll see um, number 52 of the act. Um, you'll see number 52 uh, is there's two number 52s, and there's no number 53. Um, so that's just a dumb error, right? A clerical error, it just means no one's gone through with a with a fine tooth comb. And then there's at least three acts, where they clearly have charged a substantive crime. But rather than calling it a racketeering act and a conspiracy overt act, they only call it a conspiracy overt act. And so if you look at number 23, for example, yeah, there's number 52 and 52, and then it goes to 54. Um, but if you if you go to uh, number 23, I think it is salty, if you want to put that one up, you'll see that it lists a substantive crime, but it doesn't list at the bottom uh, that it's both a racketeering act and a overt act, it just says overt act. And I don't know if she meant to do that or didn't mean to do that. And there's a few possibilities. See, act C, it says in there, honor about the third day of December, Giuliani and Eastman and all, et cetera, um, were, were um, in violation of o, you know, OCGA section 1647 to 1610-1. At the very end, it says this was an overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy. Now, if you go to now number 24, if you can pull that up, Salty, you'll see that um, number 24 um, will have slightly different language at the what end. What does it mean though, Karen? I mean, I get what? the differences, but from a prosecutor standpoint, from an elemental charging standpoint, what is the difference? Is it something she has to clean up in a superseding? I think is so. It just, is it just yeah. sloppy? What to explain to the audience? Yeah. What what because we're just using terms now, overt act, not overt yeah. act. Yeah. Well so what if you see mean? If you see number 24, it says at the bottom, this was an act of racketeering act activity 
and an overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy. And the reason it's significant is because in order to be convicted of RICO, you have to be, um, each person has to also have committed two of these racketeering acts, right? They have to have found been found guilty of committing these two substantive crimes. So, you know, it's just important to list in there that this is one of those substantive crimes, right? And so that's why it matters. Now, it might not be a mistake. Um, I'll tell you the two reasons it might not be a mistake. Number one, RICO requires, only allows certain crimes to be pattern acts or over, or, you know, RICO acts. And so the, we, so I have to see if these are designated crimes under RICO. I did look, I did try, and Georgia is not an easy statute to understand. So I'm hoping we'll get some clarity on that. Um, or perhaps maybe, you know, they don't think they have those crimes beyond a reasonable doubt or, you know, whatever it is, you know, there could be reasons for this that is not a mistake. It's just things that I saw were kind of different um, in this. And, and there's a few other little typo type mistakes in there um, that made me think that this was slightly rushed. But it, but other than that, I do think it's a sweeping indictment. I think it's excellent. I think it is just absolutely uh, makes them all look like, you know, where, whereas the Jack Smith or other ones, you can make this claim of, you know, the other side will make this claim of free speech or First Amendment. These are words. This makes them look like just regular old criminals, right? Like this, this just absolutely smacks of Watergate and breaking and entering and stealing. I mean, I just can't even believe when you read some of the sections in here. Um, and you look at the manner and methods section, it's actually titled Man manner and methods. And that's kind of the meat of the crime. That's the meat of the indictment. And it talks about, you know, false statements and lying to, you know, during legislative hearings, right? Um, and, you know, high ranking officials like Brad Raffensperger, you know, being contacted and pressured or the creation and distribution of these fake documents, right? Harassment and intimidation of a, of the election worker Ruby Freeman. She, so Shea Moss is not mentioned in count fifty in in the in the. Um, I, think, I think she was harassed a different way. I think. Yeah, yeah. I think that's tr Kanye's true. Kanye stylist contacted um, yeah. Ruby and tried to convince her to say that things were going awry inside the room when they weren't. In other words, have her lie. Exactly, and I and look, I think. I'm so glad that Shea Moss and Ruby Freeman, who is listed in there later um, in, in, uh, in Act 56, um, I am so glad they're in this indictment because for two reasons. Number one, for them, because what they went through was so egregious and so uh, difficult. Um, but number two, because as a prosecutor, this at the end of the day is a paper case, right? It's not a blood and guts case. <laughs> the way you, you don't have, you know, you don't have a victim. The American people are the victim. The electorates are the victim. And paper cases can get kind of boring. You got a victim like Shea Moss and Ruby Freeman who will get up there and testify about what it's like to have the president of the United States come after you and how you have to move from your home and how you are getting called horrible names and death threats. They are going to be the two most powerful witnesses they're going to put a face to this horrific crime. And I think the bullying and the, you know, you, you can only chalk up so much to, oh, that this is political speech, right? This is politics. This is people just saying things and, and, and legitimately questioning elections, et cetera. When you put Shea Moss and, Ru and Ruby Freeman up on the stand, that is, that is where it goes. It's nobody will say that that was okay. And as a prosecutor, that's gold. And so I'm so glad they're in there just from a, the case standpoint, again, like I said, for them too, but as a prosecutor, that, that is so powerful and that's going to be uh, incredible. And, you know, the way she presented the acts was in chronological order. And so, I think she did that because she wanted to tell a story. It's a little, and, and I think that's a good way to do it because, you know, that's really what you have to try to figure out um, in one, in a case like this, when it goes to the jury, uh, a case like this can be overwhelming for a jury. And that's one of the downsides to Rico is they just become overwhelmed and, and there are different ways you can do it. She decided to do it chronologically, which, you know, 
is good and bad. It's good because it tells a story, but it's not great because then you're burying some of your best facts. And so we'll see how she actually tries it, but that's clear. That's why she did it this way was to tell a story. Yeah. Um, and so then you asked me another question and I well, can't well, let, let's, let's, uh, <laughs> let's, we got a lot to talk about and we're going <laughs> to, we're going to talk about it all, including your prosecutor viewpoint, the judge that's been selected, whether we're going to stay in state court or federal court for some or all of these people, the, 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 um, the difficulty of trying 19 people or something around that number in one sprawling trial. It's one thing to indict them in one piece of paper. It's another thing to try the case. But we're going to do all of that when we return. But first, a note from our sponsors. Green Chef is the number one meal kit for eating clean. Feel your best with delicious, nutritionist approved recipes featuring clean ingredients with no artificial colors, sweeteners, high fructose corn syrup, and limited added sugar and processed ingredients. Choose from recipes featuring lean proteins like turkey, sockeye salmon, barramundi, tilapia, scallops, and shrimp, certified organic whole fruits and vegetables, organic cage-free eggs, and plenty of whole grain options. Eat the clean, easy way with recipes that help manage your weight and support your wellness goals without skimping on flavor. Feel your best this summer with seasonal recipes featuring certified organic fruits and vegetables, organic cage-free eggs, and sustainably sourced seafood. Also, Green Chef is the only meal kit that has both carbon and plastic offset. Green Chef offsets 100% of the delivery admissions to your door, as well as 100% of the plastic in every box. Plus, nearly all packaging materials are curbside recyclable in most areas of the U.S. Green Chef delivers everything you need to eat clean the easy way this summer. Fill your best with nutritionist-approved recipes, packed with clean ingredients that support your your healthy lifestyle and tastes great too. I love Green Chef. My absolute favorite is the spicy chicken and broccoli stir fry. Delicious. Go to greenchef.com slash legalaf50 and use code legalaf50 to get 50% off plus free shipping. That's greenchef.com slash legalaf50 and use code legalaf50 to get 50% off plus free shipping. Green Chef, the number one meal kit for eating well. Did you know that your temperature at night can have one of the greatest impacts on your sleep quality? If you wake up too hot or too cold, I highly recommend you check out Miracle Made's bed sheets. Inspired by NASA, Miracle Made uses silver infused fabrics and makes temperature regulating bedding so you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. Using silver infused fabrics originally inspired by NASA, Miracle Made sheets are thermoregulating and designed to keep you at the perfect temperature all night long. So you get better sleep every night. These sheets are infused with silver that prevent up to 99.7% of bacterial growth, leaving them to stay cleaner and fresher three times longer than other sheets. No more gross odors. Miracle sheets are luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands and feel as nice, if not nicer, than bed sheets used by some five-star hotels. Stop sleeping on bacteria. Bacteria can clog your pores, causing breakouts and acne. Sleep clean with Miracle. Go to trymiracle.com slash legal AF to try Miracle made sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use our promo legal AF at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle is so confident in their product, it's back with a 30 day money back guarantee. And if you're not 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash legalaf and use the code legalaf to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40%. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash legalaf to treat yourself. Thank you, Miracle Made, for sponsoring this episode. All right, we're back. Thank you to our sponsors. You're so, so good at that. <laughs> Your enthusiasm. There's a backstory okay. about that particular one I will tell you offline at another time. But I love the sponsors. I love that they're here. And it's really important because it keeps everything kind of moving along here. Speaking of moving along, let's stay in the topic, stay in the moment. But I, I, got a, I have an, an issue that's near and dear to your heart. In July, um, on another on issue, um, but interviewed, um, Alvin Bragg, the Manhattan district attorney, was asked about his trial date for Stormy Daniels being in March. And knowing that he, there was already a Mar-a-Lago indictment and an upcoming indictment, which happened, that Jack Smith brought 
in the District of Columbia um, and anticipating that, just as Letitia James, the New York Attorney General, also in an interview a month or two before that, said that she anticipated that her civil fraud case, even though it's $250 million against everybody named Trump, except for Ivanka, apparently, um, that she's expecting that she'll take a back seat or she'll have to be, she'll, put, she'll have to hold the ring and, um, and stay her case while these criminal cases line up in front of her. Alvin, of course, suggesting that maybe his case, which doesn't deal with Jan 6, doesn't deal with the the uh, the, the coup um, that Donald Trump led in order to cling to power and overthrow democracy, he might take a back seat. And maybe anticipating that, not because they made a phone call to each other, but maybe anticipating that, you know, Fawny Willis is out of the box today going, I got a great date for this. I think I'm, I'm free on the, on the 4th of March. How about everybody else to try this case? And she's put it in respect, respectfully before the federal case by Jack Smith in Mar-a-Lago, but also before there's a settled date with Judge Chutkin in the new DC indictment, because that hearing is not until I think the 28th or the 25th of August. So it's another 10, 12 days away when we get the date. There, the government has said, January is good for us. Why don't we pick a jury right before Christmas? Everybody loves to do that. I can tell you that as a trial lawyer, juries just love to be pulled in two weeks before Christmas for a jury selection. Um, and we'll try the case in January, Your Honor, and let's try that. And we know the other side for the Jan 6 case is going to say, how about never? How about we never have a trial or we have a trial sometime after the election? Let's wait till after the election, Judge. And we have Judge Tanya Chutkin, who's made it clear this is her courtroom, and she's going to administer justice this the right way uh, without respect of any political view, um, uh, or to paraphrase Judge Chutkin in her hearing, um, I understand your guy's got a day job, but he's just a criminal defendant um, in front of me. So uh, she'll pick some date. It's not going to be January, but she'll pick some date respectful of the other date with Judge Cannon. You got this one. And now, Phony Willis, hey, I got a sprawling indictment involving seven states and fake electors and and uh, impersonations and and uh, and all of that also. And I want to go and I'm ready and I'm in Fulton County and I got an easier road to hoe because my my law is easier. And I let's just have a quick set of pretrial motions and, and hearings and meetings and judge. I'm ready to try a case. OK, that's one. And then the second thing to comment on, Karen, is Meadows has jumped out first as one of the White House aides. He was the chief of staff at one time. Uh, we're not surprised that he was indicted. We thought he was not going to be indicted with Jack Smith, but that there was no reason he couldn't be indicted with Fawny Willis, and that happened. He's out saying, I'm federal officer, uh, at least during the relevant time period, and I did my things under the color of my office, and therefore under a provision of the federal jurisdictional statute we call removal, I get to take my case to federal courthouse doesn't mean we lose Fonnie Willis's team as a prosecutor. Doesn't even mean we lose Georgia law, nor does it mean a federal pardon would help. It just means different judge. We don't like, we, he didn't even wait to see who the judge would be. He was just like, well, I want to be in federal court. All right. He's in federal court. He got a federal judge. It's an Obama appointee, an African-American judge who sits in the Northern District of Georgia. Um, I don't think that's helpful to him ultimately, but he's, he, you asked for it, you got it. Um, so talk about, and then of course, Trump will follow right behind that. Talk, talk to me about Manhattan DA versus that case versus the March other date for Fawny. And who do you think, what do you think happens there? And then comment on the federal removal and whether you think it's ultimately be successful and whether Fawny should even fight it, given the fact that the wheels spun and it landed on a really good judge for her. Look, there's no way Fonnie Willis is going in March. It's just not happening. She's not going before the election. It's not possible. There's 19 defendants and you have this giant sweeping 100 page, 98 page indictment. I mean, you know, just to just to look at two other RICO cases that she has brought in her jurisdiction. There was one uh, that she did against the teachers, uh, like a teachers union. And that was 12 defendants who went to trial. So she can have, she can seat a lot of people in a courtroom. Uh, I've never had or seen a 12 defendant trial in, in my practice. It's a lot of people in one room, but she's done it. And so assuming a few people are gonna flip because that typically happens, or at least plead guilty because that typically happens. I don't think all 19 will go to trial. Like say she whittles it down to around 12, you, you could see them going all together. Uh, but even so, that last that teacher's case took about two years to try. So there's no way she's going to she's going to start that um, and and have that go for for two years 
well, I mean, what happens when, you know, he runs for president, what happens, God forbid, he wins, all, all that kind of stuff. Um, but just to get 19 people's motion practice and, you know, all the things that will happen that take time in a trial, I just don't see this happening in March. So it, it, there's another case, too, that she has um, been prosecuting that's going on right now, another RICO case involving uh, a young, a, a rapper called Young Thug or something like that. Uh, they started jury selection seven months ago, and they still are in the middle of jury selection. That's how hard it is. Uh, yeah, YSL, thanks, Salty. Uh, that's how hard it is to um, even seat a jury in a case uh, in a case like this. So I, I just don't see this. We happening. got another. We got another rationale. We got breaking news, Karen. We're gonna we're gonna mention here the dovetails with what you're talking about, and it's gonna piss off Judge McBurney, supervising the grand jury, and the presiding judge uh, McAfee. Well, we have we have reporting that Trump supporters are now targeting members of the Fulton County Grand Jury that indicted Donald Trump and his 18 co-defendants. They've even on a fringe right wing, deep, dark website posted the home addresses, doxed the grand jury. Um, and so, look, there's going to have to be a lot of uh, protection for this ju judicial process. And I'm sorry that Judge McAfee is only three months on the bench, but he's gonna have to put on his big judge pants because there's there's just things he never was taught in judge school that he's now gonna have to handle on the fly. Along with the rest, this kind of behavior and activity could end up back in Jack Smith's uh, cases in filings that he's gonna make to get to get Judge Chutkin's attention and Judge Cannon's attention. But really terrible, terrible things. I'm sure in your long career as a prosecutor, you never had a defendant dox the grand jury that indicted them. No, and don't forget uh, the E. Jean Carroll case, right? In that case, you know, the the um, there was a an anonymous jury, right? You had the judge, Lewis Kaplan, rule that there was a likelihood that the judge, that the um, jurors could be harassed or tampered with or threatened. You know, he, he had some pretty strong language there. Uh, and so, you know, that's, that's where there's an anonymous, so he ruled for an anonymous jury. Here, the names go out, you know, the, and, and you see what the Trump supporters are already doing. I think it's going to be hard to find someone who's going to be able to say, yeah, I can do this and sit and fair and impartial, you know, for fear of, of Trump and his supporters. So I, I just don't see this happening anytime soon um, because of that. I, I, I think just you're think right. I think the jury selection process, as you're commenting on, I mean, first of all, whether the judge even considers what we call sequestration, which is used in a rarest, I mean, you see in the movies a lot, but in reality, it doesn't happen, which is, sorry, jury, you're going to be living in a hotel under, you know, martial protection or bailiff protection over the next three weeks or a month or six weeks. And everybody gets groans. Oh, no. And nobody wants to do it. Or more importantly, like you said, you got to protect the jury. So you're going to have to have an anonymous jury. It's going to yeah. freak people out. Why, you know, this is so, so ridiculous, uh, so uh, sad that his supporters are doing everything they can do to undermine Donald Trump's ability to get a fair and impartial jury uh, consistent with his constitutional rights. It's they're doing it. It's not Fonnie Willis. Fonnie Willis's team isn't doxing Donald Trump. It's the other way around, and, and we're suffering the consequences. But you made a very good point in past podcasts, just to tie it together here, Karen. You said, by her, if we were right, which we were, that she was going to do a much more sprawling indictment, with and we didn't know exactly the amount of counts, but we figured it was going to be a, a you know, a baker's dozen of defendants and a baker's dozen or more of a criminal counts. That that alone would take her out of the running for being one of the cases to get to trial before the election, leaving Jack Smith the last prosecutor standing, and that's what you believe, right? Sorry, I had to find my mute button. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So she took herself out of the running. So she must know, yeah. th despite the, 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 the bravado of saying, I'm ready in March, Your Honor. The reality is she's not really ready in March. And that leaves Jack Smith. So let's talk about that. What do you think, if anything, because I'm sure just as we were speculating about the contours and shape of this indictment in advance, and we did a lot of really good shows and got it pretty right. Jack Smith's doing the same thing. Well, what do you think Fawny's going to be doing? What do you think her indictment looks like? How many of the battleground states do you think she's going to mention? How do you think she's going to handle Georgia? Is she going to do it like you said, Karen, chronologically? Or is she going to sort it some other way? And what do I do next? Does this impact him at all in terms of his next steps, having now, now he's seen it, 
What does he do with it, if anything, in amending, superseding his indictments or actions he takes in his two criminal courthouses for Donald Trump? I don't think one has anything to do with the other. I think Jack Smith, you know, I have always said, I don't think there's been any coordination, any communication uh, at all, other than Bonnie Willis stating publicly to the world, you know, without saying it, saying, oh, you know, let's protect, you know, news might come. So let's protect everybody, police and law enforcement. I think that was her, her hat tip to Jack Smith to let him know if you're going to go, you know, go. Um, I think these things are just uh, proceeding on their own. The, o- the only overlap thing that is a head scratcher for me that I just cannot figure out is Mark Meadows. There are people who, like Ty Cobb, who went on the air you know, for C- to CNN uh, last night, who said absolutely 100% uh, Mark Meadows is cooperating federally with Jack Smith. And he's just certain of that. And he's former White House counsel. Um, and he he just believes that to be the case. There are other people who say, no, he's not formally cooperating. He's helping and with an understanding that he will enter into a formal cooperation agreement another time. But it just, the reason it's a head scratcher for me and the reason I don't understand it is let's say he is cooperating. And if he is cooperating, he he is he is absolutely part of this criminal enterprise, right? He is very much um, uh, a, a, a large part of this of this organization and committed lots of crimes alongside of, of of Donald Trump. But he would also be a great witness because he was literally the in the room where it all happened, right? He was the one that Cassidy Hutchinson went into, and he was the one on the phone with with Donald Trump. And Cassidy was saying, you know, make it stop, and he was saying, you know. It, he won't do anything about it. You know, and he, 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 as you see from this indictment too, he was all over the place making phone calls and, and, and participating in so much of these schemes. And so he's absolutely someone you'd want to cooperate, right? But in the federal system, in order to cooperate, if you are a criminal, you know, like he is, you would have to plead guilty to all of your crimes, which means you have to admit them all. And you have to, you know, you can't kind of half cooperate the way Alan Weisselberg did in, uh, in the Trump organization trial, where he sort of, you know, it agreed to testify against the Trump organization, but refused to testify against Trump. You know, that's kind of a, a half cooperation that frankly, I've never seen before. Um, but in the feds, that doesn't fly at all. You have to admit to all your crimes, even things that have that that um, are unknown to the government, right? Even other things, like even things that have nothing to do with this. So let's say he is cooperating and he did admit to all those crimes. How is he going to fight it in the state, right? He's now admitted to all these things. And since these, what happened in the, the Georgia section of Jack Smith's indictment and Fonnie Willis's Georgia section of her indictment um, are, there's nothing inconsistent. You know, there's some facts in Fonnie Willis's that we didn't know about, you know, that wasn't in Jack Smith's and maybe vice versa because uh, different ones will highlight different things, but but there's nothing inconsistent, right? So Mark Meadows, if he's already, if he's already admitted to all that in Jack Smith's case, then he's, those are all admissions for this case. So how can he fight this case? Which, and, and he has a really good lawyer, right? Um, uh, the Terwilliger is his last name and he's a good lawyer. He would never have arranged for cooperation in one and not the other that again makes no sense um, and so so there's a couple of there's a couple of questions about what's actually happening there and now we see Mark Meadows try go to remove he's the first out of the gate to try to remove his case his prosecution from state court to federal court under the removal doctrine which which has several components one of it which you you have to be a federal officer uh, another is that you have to um, been acting under the color of your authority as a federal officer and you have to have a plausible federal defense now I think there's only three people in Fonnie Willis's indictment that were federal officers, Trump, Meadows, and Jeff Clark. So they're the only ones who could be removed if they choose to remove, not sure. There are some people, and you alluded to this, that there are some people who who believe that Trump might not, might choose not to, uh, not to, 
to uh, do the removal because the judge, they, the judge Jones, who they, who they pulled there might not be favorable to him, certainly as favorable as the state court judge that, that he pulled. But now, let me mention Jones for a minute before we move on, as I mentioned him earlier. Stephen Jones is an Obama appointee. He was confirmed by the Senate, just to show you how things have changed. In 2011, he was confirmed 90 to zero. You don't hear those numbers anymore. Confirmations, you know, are more like 52 to 48, if that. Um, but, you know, his, um, yes, this is going to be the judge to decide for these three. And there is there is some speculation that maybe Fawny just lays down and says, you know what? You want to do that there with, with Judge Jones presiding? Georgia law, Georgia prosecutors, Georgia crimes. Let's do it. Let's go. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. But there's one other thing that, again, and I'm, I'm throwing this out there because I think I think time will tell and legal research will tell how this plays. Because again, there's, it does not make sense that Terwilliger would arrange a plea deal for Meadows in uh, Jack Smith case and not in Fonnie Willis's case without having something up his sleeve. And the thing that he might have up his sleeve, and again, this is we need more legal research on this, but this is what I'm kind of playing with and trying to figure out, is analogous to something we've talked about uh, many times, which is the Westfall Act that applies in civil cases, right, where the government substitutes uh, themselves, uh, you know, for for a defendant, and then therefore you have immunity because you know. You can't really sue, you know, for defamation, for example, sue the government for that. Um, there's something called 28 CFR section 50.15, which has to do with criminal prosecutions for acts that reasonably appear to have been performed within the scope of the employee's employment. And the attorney general or his designee determines that providing representation would otherwise be in the interest of the United States. Um, you know that so th there's that and that has to, you know has to do with whether or not you will um whether or not you will hire a lawyer for the person right or pay for their lawyer but there's also under that if you do some research there there's there's the supremacy clause right so will he get will mark meadows get immunity if it's removed to federal court under the suprem supremacy chart clause, because this is a state court prosecution, you know, will, if it gets removed, will that then make him immune from prosecution? Maybe that's what he has up his sleeve, because if you read his removal papers, you know, in footnote two, uh, the lawyer says, look, we're going to submit another, in, in another submission, we're going to, you know, give you our reasoning for why, you know, he's, this should be dismissed and, and why he, he's, I think it says why he's immune. I just think that he's got something up his sleeve and I want to, I want to all just kind of put your spidey sense up and, and keep your ears out. Cause there's something going on there that, that we haven't figured out yet. Cause these, these, no, these aren't dummies. Right. Um, but, and so there's something going on there with Mark Meadows that, that we haven't figured out yet. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll put my uh, thinking cap on and we'll come back and hit it. Along with, uh, we also want to talk about today, um, Judge Mershon, the judge who's been uh, presiding over the Donald Trump Stormy Daniels prosecution that's going to trial, at least on paper, in March, and an effort by Donald Trump to disqualify him. This sounds familiar. Disqualify him um, and remove him while Donald Trump is busy um, calling prosecutors, uh, their families, and trial and and trial counsel and uh, judges deranged, uh, um, you know, against him, biased, um, crackheads, you know, uh, uh, people that are having extramarital affairs with their clients and everything else, disgusting. While they're doing all of that, he also tried to disqualify Judge Mershon. We'll talk about that in Twitter being in hot water ever since Elon Musk took over the reins there, and this time in front of what was then the chief judge of the district court, Beryl Howell. Now that we have our hot little hands on the transcript, 300-page transcript of what happened in her courtroom, it's eye-popping, and we'll cover it next after a word from our sponsor. Let's stop cutting down trees to make toilet paper. It's true. Humans are cutting down tens of thousands every day just to supply the American need for toilet paper. 
And the worst part is that when we use trees for toilet paper, it's just one use and done. It obviously can't be recycled or reused, so it just goes straight into our water system. That's why I made the switch to real paper. Real is 100% bamboo, so we're using a plant that grows fast, can be harvested and regenerated like grass on a lawn, and it doesn't impact entire ecosystems of forests. Real is the best kind of eco-friendly product because it doesn't feel like you're sacrificing something to help the earth. In fact, it feels like an upgrade. It's always shipped free to my door in plastic-free packaging, and I can schedule it on a subscription so that it comes exactly when I need it. And I never have to worry about forgetting to buy any at the store. Real is now partnered with one tree planted. With every box of Real that you buy, they are funding reforestation efforts across the country. So unlike the other TP that cuts down trees, Real is helping to actively plant them. I'm thrilled to have Real Paper as a sponsor to align my eco goals with a product that nature makes me use every day and to avoid further impact on the planet. Real Paper is available in easy, hassle-free subscriptions or for one-time purchases on their website. All orders are conveniently delivered to your door with free shipping in 100% recyclable plastic-free packaging. If you head to realpaper.com slash legalaf and sign up for a subscription using code legalaf at checkout, you'll automatically get 30% off your first order and free shipping. That's R-E-E-L-P-A-P-E-R dot com slash legalaf or enter promo code legalaf to get 30% off your first order plus free shipping. Let's make a change for good this year and switch to real paper. Real is paper for the planet. And we're back. We're reeling it in ourselves. Let's let's uh, hightail it up to Manhattan. You'll you'll like this part. <laughs> Talk about the Manhattan DAs. You know, first out of the shoot, first to indict, first to I don't know what. Um, they have the, the first one to get the trial on the docket. Uh, March, uh, the end of March of 2024, middle of March of 2024, um, is the case that's at least on the paper on paper going to trial. One defendant, Donald Trump. Um, Many counts, I think in that one, there's 37 or 34, forget which one, um, all arising out of the Stormy Daniels hush money cover-up affair and the resulting business fraud, business record fraud in front of Judge Mershon, the same judge, Juan Mershon, who who presided over the 17-count conviction of the two major Trump subsidiaries for tax fraud last year. And that's the case that Karen just talked about related to Alan Weisselberg, the longtime CFO, who spent five and a half months in Rikers Island, not a fun place, uh, while holed up there uh, as part of his sentence. And he also uh, cooperated in his own way against the Trump organization and, um, and, and the like. Trump not liking Judge Mershon at all and the fact that he donated $38 or whatever it was to Joe Biden's campaign and his daughter, his adult daughter works for a uh, political uh, PR firm that gives uh, strategy tips to Democratic uh, candidates, although she didn't particularly work on anyone related to Donald Trump's opponents um, and all the other nasty things that he said about him and says that he's he not because of anything he did in the courtroom because there's nothing in the courtroom that would suggest that he's biased in any way. And that's the problem. And the way it works in every court around America, the judge themselves makes the ultimate decision whether they are going to be disqualified or not, or what we call recused. And then if you don't like the decision, you could take it up on appeal. But it goes to the, the I know, and I have, I will tell you that I have filed a, 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 just a small handful. This is not something you take lightly uh, to do this. You have to really have the goods and have the facts um, and I had him in a, I think that we've done it twice in my entire 32 years and was successful both times because it was really bad things that happened. Uh, but you, you have to go to the same judge. And so y- you better have it because if he's, if he's going to deny it, if he's as bad as you thought he was, you got to take the appeal and be prepared. So Kara, why don't you jump in with Judge Mershon having gotten an ethical ruling from the judicial panel beforehand that gave him a lot of comfort and then what he said and his, you know, reproachment of Donald Trump, um, and and then where do we go from here? And then we'll we'll end the podcast today talking about Twitter and Judge Beryl Howell. Yeah, Judge Mershon, uh, you know, basically said, "I have searched my conscience and my heart, and you know, sought advisory opinion, and I will not recuse myself 
from this case. This stems from a May 31st, uh, Donald Trump filed a motion seeking recusal with his lawyer, Susan Necklace, who's the same lawyer who represented him in the Trump org case, uh, June, and then in June, the government or um, the prosecution responded. And, you know, the and the court, as you, as you said, has, had written to the Judicial Ethics Advisory Committee, before they even filed these motions in April, asking for a formal advisory opinion, because it had come out through the um, through the various publications, you know, that that you have to report who donates. It came out that he had donated these tiny de minimis amounts of money to um, you know, to to a I think it was like a get out the vote for anyone anti-Trump, it was like $15 or something like that. I mean, it was just a ridiculous amount of money that was so low, but it was, it was absolutely in the Trump election for, you know, against Trump. And so the three arguments that, that Trump cited for recusal was, you know, had to do with his daughter. Judge Mershon had a daughter that works for an, like a, a, an, an agency or a company that that does um, grassroots advocacy on behalf of uh, Democratic candidates. So he says, you know, there's political financial interest of the court's adult daughter creates an actual or perceived conflict because rulings may result in money for to his daughter. The second thing he said was the court's role in the prior case encouraging Ellen Weisselberg to cooperate against Trump showed preconceived bias against Trump. And number three, that the campaign contributions made by the judge in 2020 raise, if true, at least the appearance of impartiality. I think they meant partiality, not impartiality. Uh, I think they meant a typo. Um, uh, but, you know, that, that raises the appearance. And the judge said, look, you know, the right to an impartial judge is a, a basic requirement of due process. But, you know, it's up to me whether I recuse myself and um, I don't have to do it. You know, I, I have to make a, a decision. And he said regarding my daughter, um, I, had, I had sought an advisory committee opinion. And the advisory committee said, you know, the matter currently before the judge does not involve either the judge's relative or the relative's business, whether directly or indirectly. They're not parties or likely witnesses. And we see nothing in this inquiry to suggest that the outcome of the case could have any effect on the, rel the judge's relative's business or any of their interests. So he said, number one, that's not a reason. Number two, the, the Weisselberg case, he said, look, Trump, you made this argument um, through your organization last time trying to get me recused off the case, and it didn't work then. And this is even more far afield than that. And so it's not going to work this time either. Also, he, he, he bench slaps uh, Susan Necklace and says, look, you know, you, 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 you gave a, an affirmation that says it's based on personal information, but it's devoid of firsthand information in contrast with Susan Hoffinger, who works for Alvin Bragg, which is full of firsthand knowledge. So I'm denying here too, uh, for the same reason that I denied it in the, in the Trump org case when you tried to get me off. I know, you know, he didn't say this, but the judges are on to the fact that, that that's what Trump does is one, Can I one ask of you a question. You, you okay. know, Susan necklace by reputation. So do I, mm -hmm. weren't you surprised she filed that? Because it didn't have any facts yeah. in it. Yeah. Well, like, she's a very, very good lawyer with a great reputation. Yeah. She's well, very aggressive. You know, she, I think, I think sometimes you, you can't file facts that you don't have. You know, and so they don't yeah, file yeah. your declaration. Well, I don't think you have a choice. That's that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons a lot of people won't represent Trump. In right. addition to the fact that who he is, who he is, is because he wants you to do things that you don't normally do. So, you're, so but you're saying she made a devil's bargain and she had no choice because the client wanted her to file it. Yeah. And rather than saying, I don't feel comfortable filing a declaration that's doomed to failure and undermines my own credibility with a judge I have to appear in front of, she said, okay. I think she did. I think she did the best she could. I, yeah, I, you yeah. know, I think it's, I think, look, defendants, all defendants have a right to zealous advocacy. And she, she, and the, and the one thing I will give her a lot of credit for is she is a, she is a zealot, you know, a zealous advocate for her clients. And so I, I do think, he, you know, she believes that this is really what he wants. She's going to do it, but she's not going to lie. And so that's why it was yeah. devoid of information because she can't, she's not going to put something in so there. So that was the compromise. She submitted yeah. something, even though it was D D DOA. Um, and yeah, and the judge gave the judge the opportunity to say, I, I don't see the facts here. And yeah. Yeah. But, you know, this is the thing. We won't talk about it more today, but, you know, we've talked about it throughout on Legal AF. It's just the sacrificing on the altar of of whatever professional 
ethics and professional reputation of lawyers time and time again for Donald Trump. If you're if you represent Donald Trump, you're either indicted, soon to be indicted, disbarred, soon to be disbarred. And at a certain point, our profession, and we are members of a of a proud profession, one that I I've called home for 32 years, and you have too, you know, less, but you have too. And uh, you know, to see there's just certain things that you know you shouldn't do to maintain your ethics and the ability to appear before judges in the future and have credibility with them. I tell that to my clients all the time. I'm just not comfortable in doing that or taking that position because not because I'm worried about my own reputation, but I am because of my own ethics and professional responsibility. I always think lawyers like, like not necklace in particular, but the lawyers that we're talking about who are now indicted, they're so far away from rule, the rules of professional responsibility or conduct that they learned about in law school and that you should really read at least once a year to remind yourself. I mean, I'm, I'm on the firm ethics committee at our own firm, so I'm, I'm dialing through that book a lot, uh, but other other lawyers haven't looked at the actual rules of professional responsibility or conduct in probably twenty or thirty or forty years, and that is a problem. Even though we have to take continuing legal, legal education courses, I think man, it should be a mandatory that you brush up on ethics every year before you go out and um, represent clients. That's just my own opinion. Yeah, you know, you're right. You're right. So let's, uh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so just to know at the end, so at the end of the day, the, the judge, I'll just read you his conclusion. He mm -hmm. says, um, the judge, you know, presiding over a case is in the best position to appreciate the implications of those matters alleged in a recusal motion. In deciding whether to recuse himself, the trial judge must carefully weigh the policy of promoting public confidence in the judiciary against the possibility that those questioning his impartiality might be seeking to avoid uh, the adverse consequences of his presiding over their case. And this court has carefully weighed the competing interests outlined in a case called Drexel Birnbaum Lambert and finds that recusal would not be in the public interest. Further, this court has examined its conscience and is certain in its ability to be fair and impartial. Defendant's motion for recusal and for an explanation is denied on all grounds. Yeah, no surprise. If they don't like it, they can go take it up to the uh, first department, court of appeals, intermediary level court of appeals in Manhattan. If they don't like it there, they can try to take it to the court of appeals, the highest court in New York. But I don't think it's going to go anywhere. Judge Mershon is going to remain there. This is the second attempt to try to get rid of Mershon. They try to, as you know, using our le our lesson plan from earlier in the podcast, they tried to do a federal officer removal and take the case over to probably perhaps not a worse judge, but equally bad judge for them, Alan Hellerstein, who, was, who, who not only denied the removal, but forced them to conduct a full evidentiary hearing in which they put on evidence that only is going to strengthen the hand of Alvin Bragg in the case and got another yet another judge to say that it's more likely than not that Donald Trump committed a series of crimes in New York, uh, common law crimes, uh, garden variety crimes that aren't uh, protected by any type of federal immunity privilege. Donald Trump just likes having people in black robes say that he's a criminal because it's now it's happened on at least three occasions, um, even without the indictments being in, in, in place. And let's talk about um, somebody thinking that maybe somebody um, is a criminal or that somebody has violated her orders or somebody who is not playing um, right in the sandbox and has now been subject to uh, a federal court's um, uh, approbation and a Fine. Let me just set the mood, and then we can then we can dive into then we can dive into it. We didn't know that in January because it was secretly guarded under the privacy aspect of uh, protecting grand jury activity. But we we know now that um, that uh, Judge uh, Beryl Howell, who was then the chief judge, based on evidence presented to her by affidavit in a hearing, uh, issued a search warrant to Twitter along with a non disclosure order requiring them not to breathe a word of the search warrant seeking Donald Trump's, not just his Twitter account, not just his direct messages, but all the underlying metadata about the operation of the account, who used it, who had access to it, how many, um, how many phones or other devices had access to it and did posting. Let's see draft tweets. Let's see deleted tweets and all of that. And, um, you know, Twitter uh, around that time would have been acquired by Elon Musk, who made no secret of the fact that he was a Trump supporter and he wanted to see Trump put back on the platform um, and the like. And so um, they were late, a lot late. 
in complying with the judge's orders and the judge didn't like it. And the judge held a hearing that we now have unsealed as of today, a 300 page transcript. And the judge was none too pleased with a number of things that were being argued. First of all, you could tell from the beginning that the judge was very annoyed with Twitter. I've been sometimes in a hot seat with a judge who doesn't like my client or doesn't like the position that I need to advocate. And you can sort of sense when you're getting buffeted by headwinds. And certainly Twitter was, and I could tell why, because every time, at least in the cold read of the written transcript, I wasn't in the room, but you could tell that the judge was asking pretty simple questions and was looking for pretty simple, basic answers. And instead was getting a lot of, uh, what do we call it? Lawyer tap dancing. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. And the judge was like, can we just get back? past all this, when are you producing, what did you produce, what's missing, and why haven't you produced it? And then the judge went on the record um, in lit lighting into uh, reaming these lawyers and saying, it looks to me like your client, Elon Musk, is trying to curry favor with Donald Trump by dragging his feet and also perhaps tipping him off at, which is a violation of the non-disclosure order, about the fact that the search warrant was out there. The search warrant was issued with a non-disclosure order because the government had convinced the judge based on their evidence that it was more likely than not, or a preponderance of the evidence at least standard, that um, Donald Trump would interfere with the investigation if he knew about the Twitter account being grabbed, that he would interfere with witnesses and intimidate witnesses. And they even at least accidentally checked the box for he's a flight risk, Donald Trump. And when the judge uh, granted it, she actually put a line in about his being a potential flight risk, even though that wasn't one angle the government was really pushing at that time. And we learned about it because Twitter appealed. They didn't like the fact that they got fined $350,000 and they thought their constitutional First Amendment rights were violated. So they took it up on appeal to the DC Circuit Court. And Judge Pan for the DC Circuit Court said, um, who's a, a Biden appointee, said, yeah, no, uh, she was right, you were wrong. I'm summarizing. And uh, your, your First Amendment rights are not implicated here. And you had a non-disclosure order that was violated and you have to pay the fine. The fine was well within her abilities to do that. They had seen the transcript that we've now gotten our hands on and good day. Uh, but we got in there Judge Pan describing aspects of the transcript we now have, including the possibility that Donald Trump was a flight risk as grounds for the non-disclosure order and denying their appeal. So what did you pick up from uh, the judge and what did we learn? I don't really give a shit about Twitter. What did we learn about Donald Trump, both because of the order and the transcript and then what he has said afterwards, including him saying to his followers, I had no idea about the secret search warrant. It looks like that's wrong, once again, that he lied to his followers and that he was tipped off by Twitter. What'd you pick up from your read of the transcript? I know you're doing, I think you're doing a hot take on it too, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good. Um, the, uh, a couple of things. So first of all, just backing up for a minute, uh, it's very routine for prosecutors to um, subpoena social or to do a search warrant for social media companies. And, and you do a search warrant because you need to establish probable cause that a crime occurred and that evidence of the crime will be found uh, in the um, in the thing that you're searching. And so there's no difference between a search warrant for a, for Mar-a-Lago or a home that there is for a social media account. You have to spell out in an affidavit the probable cause that a crime occurred, and you have to spell out why you think the evidence of that crime will be located in the place that you are uh, searching. You can't just do a phishing ex expedition. Um, you have to have probable cause. So, and you don't, the, the person like Twitter or the defendant or anybody will not actually see the affidavit that spells out the probable cause. All they see is the warrant because every search warrant has two parts. There's the affidavit and the warrant and the affidavit is the probable cause and all the details. And the warrant is the, you know, from the judge that says, you know, I am judge so-and-so. I, ha having read the affidavit, I find that there is probable cause to believe that this crime occurred. And I am also satisfied that there is probable cause to believe that the following evidence exists in the following location. Therefore, I am allowing these law enforcement officers to go search the following. And that's how a warrant is basically in a nutshell. That's the su a summary of a warrant. And that's all that you get to see. So Twitter didn't get to see the affidavit uh, that was 
that it, where a judge found that there was probable cause that Donald Trump committed a crime, nor did they get to see the affidavit that, you know, had what crime exists. All they got was the warrant that said, you, you must turn over X, Y, and Z. And, uh, and they were stalling and they didn't want to turn it over. And, and the other thing that the prosecutors did that's also standard is they, um, they will ask a court to order non-disclosure, which means don't tell this is an ongoing investigation and don't tell the defendant, the target, Donald Trump here about the fact that I'm doing the search warrant. Because if you do, I think he could destroy evidence. He could you know, tamper with evidence. He could tamper with witnesses and he could flee the jurisdiction, right? I've, I've always said he's this guy. I don't understand why he has no bond, why no one's taken his passport. You know, he's got a, a 757 at the ready that he can fly anywhere in the world anytime he wants, right? So uh, he, he's definitely a flight risk. And he's got some he's got some relationships with some foreign countries that we don't have extradition treaties with, right? Like you've seen how he's talked about Putin and Kim Jong-un, you know, he talks about them as, as very positively, right? So you can imagine a scenario where they could give him safe haven, but you know, I digress. Anyway, so they, they asked him not to disclose to Donald Trump that the existence of this. So this is all standard fare for prosecutors. And why would prosecutors want his Twitter account? Because, you know, it's, it, the, tw the Twitter account is very much, uh, we have the tweets, right? They're in, out in the public. So why does a prosecutor need the other data in the Twitter accounts? Well, there's a couple of reasons that we learned from reading these transcripts and, and, and all of this. Um, there was a number one um, prosecutors. You want to try and um, establish who's doing the tweeting, right? Who's who's doing the communicating, and so that's one reason to try to get the information, right? Who who is it that? And, and Donald Trump designated somebody, some people back in 2017 to be his designees with the National Archives for all things. Um, all records, including his social media. In February of 2021, or January of 2021, he changed it, by the way, it was January of 2021. He wrote a letter to the National Archives revoking the, the 2017 letter and designating other people to act as his representatives for the archives, meaning Meadows, Cipollone, and, and Philbin, and some other names that we've, that we've heard. Um, and so prosecutors are gonna try to figure out who held the keys to the at real Donald Trump account? Who is the person who's communicating? Is Donald Trump tweeting or are others? Who's doing that communication? Could it be those individuals who, who are the ones who, you know, we're dealing with, with the archives, right? Could it, could it have been them? Could it have been Dan Scavino who routinely would uh, have access to his social media accounts? So it's unclear. And so that's one reason why prosecutors are, are, trying to get that information. Another reason they want it is because there's all kinds of information in there that aren't public tweets, right? There's something called fleets that I'd never heard of until this particular story, which are these vanishing tweets, you know, fleeting tweets, right? They, they put them out and they vanish. Well, were there any of those that maybe we didn't see? Or were there any deleted tweets? Were there any direct messages or DMs? And that was the thing that was so surprising that I learned uh, by reading this was, was there was quite a volume was a term they used, uh, the Twitter side used to describe how many direct messages incoming, outgoing, and de some deleted. And so there's a ton of private confidential uh, communications that we don't know about that the government has. Now, they could all be incoming because, you know, he was famously somebody who didn't um, send emails and that kind of stuff. Who knows what's there, but whatever is there, you know, I, I can guarantee he wasn't happy about it. He didn't want anyone to have it. And it looks like Elon Musk was absolutely trying to cozy up to Trump, according to the judge who even said, why are you, why are you doing this? You know, on the one hand, you say, you know, First Amendment, First Amendment, First Amendment, you know, and, and that's why we want to share it with him. But isn't this the same person whose account you suspended because you said, you know, uh, the First Amendment? So it was just that's what I thought was sort of interesting. But, you know, apparently there's this there are millions and millions of, you know, of of 
data uh, information um, that you know was turned over. So I thought that was I thought that was sort of interesting. Yeah, and um, you know we originally reported it as oh they're getting the tweets. Why can't that's not hard to get? I could get them all the tweets, but it's this underlying metadata and structure. Um, and information about who tweeted and when and where were they located and who had access to the account. Because they're trying to, if they're going to do as Fawny Willis did, which is there's at least 12 tweets that form some of the overt acts, the 161 overt acts, or maybe she misnumbered, whatever, 160 plus overt acts, 13 of them or so, 12 of them or so, or his tweets, in order for to hold somebody responsible for a for a tweet being an overt act or part of a criminal conspiracy, you have to be sure that it's his doing, or maybe it's on his behalf. So that's where Jack wants to be doubly sure that if he's going to nail him for a tweet, it came from him, you know, at the White House or wherever, or on his behalf or from his account and not from somebody else. So he wants to know the number of phones and all that. And the direct messages is interesting. You to, to I mean. Of all the ways for Donald Trump to communicate, he would have communicated through DMs with other potential co-conspirators. Yeah. I mean, well, listen, they have to run that to ground as as prosecutors. It may not be that there are any, but they'd be remiss if they didn't ask for them. Um, you know, I'm not expecting there to be any in that batch, but who knows? I mean, I've seen in my time doing internal investigations, criminal investigations, and defending them, I've seen some crazy, wacky things put in writing among people involved with potential criminal conduct that you like, wow, they really never thought this would see the light of day. They're just so open and honest about not being honest. And, uh, you know, human behavior is, is, is and especially under the pressure of somebody like Donald Trump and a criminal conspiracy. Yeah, I'm sure there's, there's potentially lots of things. Whatever it is, like I said, he would be remiss as a prosecutor if his team didn't go after them and had somebody you know, takes uh, pot shots at them. Did you get the Twitter account? Oh shit, we forgot the Twitter account. So they're they're just being good, methodical prosecutors and investigators, and tracking all of this stuff, all of this stuff down. And and we do it. We do our own methodical tracking down of information and analysis. Only one place on the Midas Touch Network on YouTube. We do it on this show. We call it Legal AF. We do it on Wednesdays and we do it on Saturdays. And we've reached the end of the Wednesday edition, the midweek edition, and so much to talk about with your regular co-anchors, Michael Popak and Karen friedman Ignifolo. And to ask, to answer the questions that some of you ask us, or a lot of you ask us, how can we support one of our favorite shows? Okay, it's easy. It's all free. Watch it. That helps. Listen to it, because the same show that we are watching right now ends up a few hours later on an audio podcast version on Spotify and Apple and, and Google and all the places you get your podcasts from. So go listen to it. Do both. That helps with our ratings, if you will, the algorithms, if you will. Give us a review, hopefully a five-star review. Sound like an Uber driver, but that's important. Um, but we read those comments, and it does go in to help us with the quality and the quality control of our shows. Then uh, there's a brand new, it's two weeks old now, um, place for news about law and politics in the intersection of US law and politics. And that's the new MidasTouch.com website. And that's a place where you can get not only a, a home as a library for all of our podcasts, all the hot takes, all of the contributors like Karen, me and Ben and others on the legal front, and, and all of our stuff is stored there and, and, and uh, evergreen, as we like to say, you can grab it. But we have writing. There's now like almost like a press room uh, for a newsroom for Midas Touch with some of your contributors and others, including Karen, writing about breaking stories and analysis about law politics and that intersection. And then if you just want to geek out on legal AF merchandise – because of KFA, where's KFA? Put her back up. Okay. <laughs> we have these beautifully uh, designed Legal AF um, emblems and, and logos on t-shirts. You have the classic one. We call that Coke Classic in the middle. That's, that's our album cover, rock album cover for our podcast. But then we have, look at these that were designed by a world famous sports uh, franchise logo guy. Uh, you have classic. You've got extra crispy or crest. You've got emblem, and you've got round. It, it was very. It was a creative way for us to come up with all those names. But it gives you choices to mix and match on shirt colors with the one of your choice. And yes, 
We have shirts other than unisex. We have shirts that are tailored and cut for um, different body styles. Let's just put it that way and come in all the, all the colors and all the, uh, all the uh, sizes that people need. I have them. You have them. I've seen pictures of you and your family up. I have, I've put mine up. They're super soft. They're really nice. They're much nicer than what we had before. Although I do like the classic shirts too. We got, I think we got coffee mugs still, but this is a fun way to support. I can't tell you how many conversations that I've gotten started because I'm wearing that shirt. Yes. I'm also one of the anchors, but, but people are like, Oh, I know that show. I love that show. What is that show? And it starts a dialogue and it's a fun way to support us as well. So we, there's a link for that. And uh, and that's it, man. Everything we're talking about is just free. Thank you to all, all of our um, all of our sponsors. They're really important to the ecosystem of Midas Touch and what we do here on Legal AF. We, we try all these products. We use all these products. We talk about them because we believe in them. And they, the sponsors, believe in our progressive movement and in democracy and in justice. And that's why they're here with us. So thank them. Support them. Go on their websites. Go on their links. Use your Legal AF discounts. And, um, and there we have it. Karen, last word, then I'm off to Saturdays. You're doing hot takes. I'm doing hot takes. And we'll do this all again a week from now. Look how much has changed since the last time you and I were together. A new indictment and a new, <laughs> new potential trial date. It's exhausting. I'll leave you with, I'll leave you with the last word. It's exhausting. It's absolutely exhausting. I want to see you do your tap dancing, your lawyer tap dancing. Yeah, there you go. Come on. I've, <laughs> I've had a hot foot in court where you get, you, know, you get a little, not flop sweat, but you get a little, yeah. you know, oh. <laughs> you know, and, and I, I read that transcript and I commend people to do that. And you can tell from the beginning, this person is on a script, like there's some sort of telemarketer and yeah. they're not deviating from the script and the judge is having none of it. At, at one point, at one point the off. judge, I know at one point the judge, cause I guess he kept leaning over and whispering to the IT oh, guy. Oh, and, at, and, and at one point the judge was like, can we talk, can I talk to him? Like, why do you keep reading? If you don't know the answer and you keep leaning over and asking him, I want to ask him questions. No, no, no. You're right about that. Except you're wrong on the person. It was a woman. Oh, and, okay. and it, which made it look even worse. It looked like he was mansplaining and he wasn't letting the person with the real knowledge in the room who was yes. the woman at the table get up and speak. And she said, if you're going to keep asking, if she seems to know all the answers to my questions, why I don't know. you have her answer the questions? So this was not going I well know. in that courtroom. It and we love that know. stuff. And the I other know. thing I'll commend, and then I'm going to let you say one more thing. Is people were like, Popeye City, give her the last word, but then he didn't give her the last word. You did. Having, that's my last word. We're it's having a good. conversation. Right, right. Karen's like, that's right. I'm done. I'm not I'm done. <laughs> is, is, and tell this to your friends and family and people that you're debating with. Go read the indictment. You know where you can find it? The Midas Touch website. Go read Jack Smith's indictment, also on the Midas Touch website. And if you read it, the people that are arguing with you and are criticizing everything, reading off cards and that Donald Trump gave them, have not read. Because if they've read it cover to cover, and they've read the 161 overt acts and the supporting evidence that's reflected there, and Jack Smith's, there is no way any thinking carbon-based human could come away with the conclusion that Donald Trump isn't in trouble and it didn't, didn't potentially commit a crime. And it's fascinating to me that 70% of Republicans believe that Donald Trump did not commit a serious crime. That's the stat I just saw before in preparing for the show. 70% think he did not commit a serious crime. Of course, 99% of Democrats, and that's why it comes up like 57% of the country believes he did. But, you know, this is, this is not red or blue. This is not, this is black and white, right? What, what he did. This is justice is blind. I hate to tell people. I mean, it's not. It's not entirely, <laughs> but, but justice is blind. And, and I'm not here because you know, as I've said before, if Joe Biden had done anything that he's accused of, I would be the first one to run him out of town on a rail. I said in a tweet recently that that when when um, Al Franken did a uh, off color uh, joke that we found distasteful when he wasn't even a senator yet and he was still a comedian about one of his co his uh, his coworkers his, his colleagues. We, we ran him out of the Senate. We canceled him in 10 minutes flat. And that was off an off-color joke, not trying to tear down democracy. And so, you know, like, you know, you want to be a patriot, be a patriot. But if your guy looks like he's four-time indicted, you know, you might have a problem with your guy. You might have to be ready that he committed crimes and will be convicted. And that's okay. Go pick somebody else. 
Just like I would pick somebody else if the Democrat did it. You know, when Bill Clinton had his problems, you know, I thought I thought Ken Starr ran a field too far afield in his in, in beyond his special counsel or independent counsel powers. But I also thought that Bill Clinton may have committed some crimes, including lying, and so that was a problem. Uh, and and so that that's like on this show, on this network, we don't blow smoke or sunshine. It's not like we have an agenda. We're just reporting based on our experience what's happened, and you guys are here along for the ride. We couldn't do it without you. It'd literally just be Karen and me and Ben talking to each other. And so we're so happy that you're here. Audience has grown. We're getting close. In 2023, we're going to hit 2 million free you know, subscribers to the Midas Touch YouTube channel. And that just keeps this whole thing running. Sa so, Saturday night. How many people were watching Legal AF Live Saturday night? I think we hit 19,000. Yeah, 19,000. Well, okay. I'm very competitive. So <laughs> I want Wednesday to beat Saturday. I want We were 17,000. We had 17,000 two weeks had, ago. So, I think we had 18, no? Yeah. I think yeah, we had yeah, 18. Yeah. So I, love the, I love this side of my co-anchor, but uh, again, we're, we're competitive for very good, very good reasons. We want to get the message out and we can only do it through the legal AFers. Shout out to legal AFers and shout out to the Midas Mighty. Karen and I will see you next Wednesday and on hot takes in between. And I'll see you on Saturday with Ben Mycellus. Good night, Karen. Good night.